Well, welcome everyone. I am very excited to be here today with Joseph Levins, editor of Somerset Review. How's it going, Joseph? Welcome. Very well, very well, Becky. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. And as always, anyone, if you have any questions at all, just go ahead and type them into the chat and I will work them into the conversation. Um, so Joseph, why don't you just go ahead and tell us the origin story of the magazine? When did you start it? Why on earth did you start a literary magazine? Tell us all about it. Sure. Um, okay. Well, I founded it in 2002. And since then, we have not closed our doors to submissions, not for a single day. So we never go on hiatus. Um, I started it exactly one year after 9-11. I had been working in Lower Manhattan during the incident, and it was just a life-changing event. And I thought, you know, I've been submitting to stories for a long time, having limited success. Let's give good writers an opportunity to get their voices out there. And so I began um, the Somerset Review. It was just me and uh, an associate editor at the time. And we only did, um, we only accepted prose. We only accepted fiction and nonfiction. And just to tell you a little bit of a quick story, I sometimes write into literary magazines when I like a story that I read. So I wrote into new letters. Yeah. Right. Uh, I loved a story by Robert Day. And I just wrote into new letters and said, thank you. I really like this story. About a week later, I get an email from Robert Day. And he says, thank you very much for the nice words. They made a play out of the story. Please come to Chestertown, Maryland and see the play. Oh, so wow. I did. So I did. Yeah. Um, he's he's a pretty accomplished writer. He was the he's the chairman of um um, a university in Kansas. I believe he was also the chairman of AWP for a while. So he took me to dinner and he said, I know what your problem is. <laughs> and I said, I didn't know I had a problem. <laughs> and he said, the problem is you can't call yourself a literary magazine if you don't publish poetry. Hmm. And he said, I'm a man who not only presents a problem, but I also present a solution. And he looked to his colleague, uh, Meredith Davies Hadaway, and she volunteered to be my poetry editor for 10 years. And, wow. And when she left, um, she nominated another person, um, Erin, um, Erin Murphy, also an accomplished poet. Uh, she's a professor at Penn State, and she's been with me ever since, probably going on about another 10 years now. Mm -hmm. So I delegate everything poetry to Erin and everything prose uh, to myself. So maybe that's a quick... 30,000 view of how it all was. <laughs> no, that's great because actually that was one of my questions was how you found your initial staff and how you rounded up people. And it sounds like it happened very organically. It's actually a great lesson for writers and readers of literary magazines to not hesitate to reach out to writers when you love their work because it can lead to all sorts of great connections and projects and you know mm -hmm. interesting adventures. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. So yeah. very small staff. Um, every once in a while, I'll get an ambitious person. Usually it's a young person who says, do you need any help? And uh, we usually bring them on board. We call them a Somerset scholar. <laughs> and um, But it's basically just the two of us. <laughs> so why the name? What What is what is Somerset about? Uh, that's the name of the street that I live on. I live oh. on Long Island. <laughs> okay. And that's the name of the street. And uh, got clobbered the uh, right directly on the roof, uh, but in Hurricane Sandy by a large oak oh. tree. Oh wow! And one of my editor's notes uh, shows some pictures, but we recovered. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the magazine, if I'm not mistaken, it's completely independent. I've never seen any university affiliation, nothing about grant funding, anything like that. So that's is right. This is this all out of pocket and is this um how it's, do you sustain it okay so it's all out of pocket right i do have an it background and i have some friends in it so putting together the website was relatively easy right mm -hmm. so basically i can run this magazine uh not counting any labor or anything because i don't really pay um erin I can run this magazine for about $100 a year. Wow. 
right? And that's not, I mean, I'm not paying for any marketing uh, or anything. So that's just the web hosting, okay? And uh, so, I mean, for $100 a year, that's pretty affordable. You don't need deep pockets to do something like that. Yes, and I'm sure many editors would be interested in knowing how, so how do you, man I think the main cost for most Lit mags is managing submissions, right? So I take it you don't use submittable and all no. submissions are through email. Is that overwhelming for you? How many submissions do you get and how do you manage them? Okay, so everything's handled through email, right? Erin uh, and I consider ourselves pretty organized persons, so we uh, don't really have any confusion with that. We don't use submittable, of course, there's a fee with that. Mm -hmm. um, we've been taking submissions since 2002 and never had a problem. We get... As far as prose goes, we get about, it's a quarterly magazine, so we get about 300 a quarter, I would say, prose submissions. We probably get more poetry submissions, maybe I'll say 400 poetry submissions per quarter. And um, just a hint for all of you listening in, okay? Um, I like to publish both nonfiction and fiction. Uh, my preference would be an equal number of pieces each issue. We run about five prose pieces an issue. 90% um, of the prose submissions we get are fiction. And mm -hmm. I like to keep a good balance. So if you guys write nonfiction, you have a better chance of getting mm -hmm. accepted than, non than fiction. That, I hear that a lot with literary magazines, that they just don't get that many nonfiction submissions. Yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, I was primarily a fiction reader back in my younger days, mm -hmm. um, but I've recently taken more and more of a liking to, to nonfiction, creative nonfiction, and things like that. Well, yeah. So what kind of nonfiction are you looking for? Should it be personal essay, personal essay mixed with criticism, reporting, uh, or just purely personal or any kind of combination thereof? Mostly personal essay. Okay. Um, style counts. Um, mm -hmm. I like travel essays. I like essays that just talk about an experience and things like that. I don't know if all of you know the story with Susan Orlean. Susan Orlean, very popular nonfiction writer for The New Yorker. They approached her years ago and they said, we want you to write a collection of essays about famous people. Mm -hmm. She said, will not do. I'm going to write nonfiction pieces about everyday people in America and I'm going to make it just as exciting. Mm. that's what she did she published two collections one is called the bullfighter checks her makeup what a title right mm -hmm. <laughs> the bullfighter yeah. checks her makeup anyway she was very successful at writing uh um stories uh, essays about the er everyday people and still making it very interesting mm. yeah that's great so do you see um i i think the somerset review is so interesting because because of its sort of financial independence and its, um, do you like? Do you see it, its identity as an independent magazine as like fundamental to the ethos and the aesthetic of the journal? I guess I'm thinking like it's not because it's not affiliated with any university. It it really seems to stand as its own thing. Like it's not. Um, it, it's just I I just think it's like such a lovely kind of humble <laughs> journal that stands apart from like the pack. <laughs> well, that's what, we, that, that, that's what we try to be. I try yeah. to keep it as simple as possible. If you've seen, if some of you have seen the Somerset Review, it's an extremely simple site. If you go to the homepage, it's like the cover of a book. You click on the image and you'll see a table of contents. And that's it. There's nothing fancy. There are no ads. There are no distractions. When you're reading prose or poetry on a page, that's the only thing on the page. Maybe a little graphic to make it look a little nice, but that's it. And it's very easy to maintain. Yeah. yeah. How, what have you um, learned over the years? Because it's uh, it's been around for a long time. <laughs> um, so um, how, how has your sense of publishing a lit mag changed over the years? What have you learned about the process? Um, you know, how is your thinking about it maybe evolved? 
I don't think it's really changed all that much. I mean, once you have an issue going and if, and if it's fairly simply laid out, it's just a matter of changing the content for the new issue. Mm -hmm. So I'll copy an existing issue to a new area and just change the text. We have a new poet, we have a new uh, prose writer. So it's not really very complicated as far as the actual publishing of it go. As far as like handling submissions and reading submissions and evaluating submissions, I don't think that's changed much either. Uh, I'm trying to think, um, probably the, the biggest headache that we have, and if I wanna even call it a headache, is when we get a partial withdrawal of a poetry submission. Mm. In other words, a poet will say, please uh, do not consider one of five poems that I had submitted to you because it was accepted at another place. It gets a little messy the way we handle that. But um, other than that, it's, I mean, we've been around so long that it's, it kind of runs on cruise control almost. All the work is in reading submissions, really. Yeah. So actually, that's funny because I just discussed that in one of our weekend conversations. So if a poet withdraws one poem from a packet, does that affect the rest of the packet? Will it make you look at that packet sooner or not consider the packet or does it not affect the others really at all? No, uh, it doesn't really affect it at all. Okay. Although we do get on occasion a poet writing in saying um, one poem is withdrawn and the next week another poem is withdrawn okay. and like the next week another poem is withdrawn and which leads us to believe is this person sending these poems everywhere in creation? And, you know, uh, so we're a little apprehensive when that happens, but it doesn't happen all that often. Okay. Um, and we have a question here, um, sort of broadly, do you accept reprints? And if not, um, what about a, an essay that was published like on a personal blog? Um, for the first one, no, we don't accept uh, reprints. For the second one, I will consider it. I, I guess I just would ask the writer for full disclosure, you know, um, where was it published? How long was it up? How easy is it to get to? But other than that, I, I would I would consider that, yeah. Okay. So going to the aesthetic a little bit, um, what tell us what you like to see in submissions what will make uh since we'll start with the fiction since you get um so many fiction submissions what really makes a work stand out for you okay so we do have i do have a page that gives advice for prose writers so if you go to this um submission guidelines page there's a link that, on that page to another page called advice for prose writers and i described there some of what I'm looking for and what kind of turns me off. Um, I guess I'll start with what turns me off. Mm -hmm. And that would be pieces that have um, excessive violence, uh, excessive foul language, um, many repeated words as far as style goes. I see that all the time. Repeated words in, in, in successive sentences mm -hmm. are like fingernails on a blackboard to an editor. It's mm -hmm. It's, you got to try to avoid that. Um, you know, if I see if I have more than a few um, markups as far as grammar and punctuation per page, that would turn me off. Um, another thing that I try to shy away from are subjects of uh, death and serious illness. I mean, these are important subjects, um, but I see a lot out there on those two and. I don't, I, there's too much, there's, there's, you know, I think there's, there's too much out there. I wrote into the New Yorker about 10 years ago, complaining. I said, a lot of your fiction has death as its main element. Mm. And the New Yorker back then was known to respond to writers, to writing in. Mm. And I did get a response from one Owen Pethery. <laughs> and he said, death is a part of life. So, um, yes, but... <laughs> I don't know. I just, so I kind of shy away from yeah. um, those things. Mm -hmm. um, what I do like, it's funny. I asked, uh, m one of my favorite literary journals years ago was called Other Voices mm -hmm. out of Chicago. And I had asked the editor, uh, Gina at 
um, AWP, what is your favorite type of story that you like? And she said, it's an old and tired theme, but I still love coming of age stories. Mm. And, and I do too. It is an old and tired theme, but I do like reading them. I like reading surreal stories where we'll play with um, something that happens that really can't happen in real life, right? But if you suspend your disbelief and go with the story, I hope that some message gets conveyed that mm -hmm. certainly does pertain to real life mm -hmm. the story um so yeah and of course style style will always wow me yeah do you think with the death and illness stories is it that you see these topics handled not well generally or you just sort of don't like you're tired of reading about it at all a little of both, I would say. Um, probably more so the latter. <laughs> yeah. Um, and when you said uh, repeated words, can you say more about that? Like, is it just a writer using, like, I think all writers sort of have pet words that they fall back on. They don't even realize that they're repeating. Is that sort of what you mean? That like a writer's repeating like the same word without realizing it over and over in a story yeah not really words like the or are or this or right, that kind of right. stuff but like a subject like hand maybe piano maybe door if i see the word door in two or three successive sentences no there's oh. another way to write than you keep yeah. using the same word <laughs> i see so that's interesting so it sounds like some good advice for writers before they submit their work would be to read it out loud and check absolutely the check the absolutely yeah. absolutely Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Oh, and we have a note here. Uh, you published Christine's poem in 2010. <laughs> oh, hi, Christine. How are you? <laughs> Very. That was when Meredith was with us. So Meredith was probably working with you. That's great. Um, so take us through the editorial process. What happens? Uh, well, first of all, do you accept? Does everything come through email or do you solicit work? Um, and then what happens when you're going through those emails? Okay, so we absolutely do not solicit work, right? Every piece gets uh, uh, reviewed objectively. We have no slosh pile, okay? Um, I read all the prose, and Erin reads all the poetry. Um, for me, the process for review is I will sit down and maybe read the first couple of paragraphs of about 10 pieces, maybe 15. And of those, I might like one or two. And I set those aside to read fully at my next, the next day I plan on coming back to the Somerset Review, which might be in a couple of days. Um, and I'll read those um, and see how I like them. Generally, I would say about 90% of the Pro submissions that I read, I abandon the read after the third paragraph. Mm -hmm. right? So pieces that turn absolutely wonderful in the end, in the last few pages, I will never have known because mm -hmm. I will not have gotten that far, right? Those first three paragraphs count so much. And I, I think I have a pretty good nose at sniffing a good story um just by reading the first two or three paragraphs mm -hmm. of it so i'll um after i read the ones that i liked um i might either accept it right away if i really liked it um or i'll put it in what's called a maybe pile where i will come back to it at some future date probably a mm, couple weeks later and read it again mm -hmm. And I have actually read some submissions three times before mm. I made a decision. And I do think some of the stronger stories out there are ones where you get more out of it on the second read. Yeah, absolutely. Right. That's so interesting. So you, um, I think what I've heard from most editors is that they're sort of reading each submission 
like individually one at a time, but you're sort of reading them in comparison, you know, like choosing your favorite openings among the 10 or 15 that you have in front of you. Yeah, it's like two different modes that I'm in. One yeah. mode, I'm, I might uh, sit down one evening and say, okay, I'm in review mode where I just want to pick out, you know, 10 stories that have promise mm -hmm. and maybe save one or two. Or I'll be in the mode where I'm going to, you know, put my feet up and read the whole story. So I have, so it's a mix. Mm -hmm. So I see the questions here, but just, I just want to stay in the stories for a moment. So what is it that you like to see? Is it strong characters? You mentioned style, um, but what are some things that will make you keep reading the story? Style definitely would be um, well-written um, as far as, you know, grammar, punctuation, um, and things like that. And as far as content, um, I'm pretty much open to anything. Um, I don't really like a lot of significant happenings taking place during the storyline. Mm -hmm. Typically, a, the significant happening would have already happened, and now we're learning about how this character is dealing with it or is yet to happen. Mm -hmm. And we are um, learning about a character who's waiting and apprehensive. Very, very character-driven stories mm -hmm. is, are the stories that I like. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so moving to poetry, Christine also wants to know, what are you not wanting to see in poetry? Mm -hmm. I think I have to defer to Erin on that one. <laughs> Um, I pretty much leave it in her hands. I really don't consider myself uh, a poet or um, one that's prone to read a lot of poetry. I, I have tons and tons of literary magazines. I read them all the time. I'm sure you do too, Becky. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, sometimes half the content of a literary magazine is poetry. I'll make an attempt, but it's sometimes a half-hearted attempt to read the poetry, so I'll admit. <laughs> so I'm don't know if I could actually help you on that one, Christine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we have sort of a big, big picture question. Um, do you think artificial intelligence will swallow up all of us human writers? Um, and I guess also like, what are you doing? What kind of conversations are you having about AI and how are you handling, you know, now editors face this problem of needing to suss out AI submissions? How are you confronting that? Uh at the moment, I'm trying to ignore it. Um, I don't know if that's a wise thing to do or not. I also teach uh, creative writing at Stony Brook uh, on Long Island, and they've instituted a rule where if a, fac if a faculty member believes a student um, used AI to write something in the creative writing class, we are not to confront the student. We send the piece to a committee, and the committee apparently does some sort of research or investigation how they determine whether or not AI generated the story, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. um, but at the moment, I don't know what to do. Um, we do have that um, occurring. Um, we also have authors out there that are stealing work from other authors, published work, and submitting it under their own name as unpublished work. And that's just as bad um, I don't know what to do there either. I don't uh, like the concept of uh, favoritism at all in uh, judging and reviewing literary submissions. Um, every magazine has a right to have their own rules as to what they want to accept and not accept. Many of them will publish nephews and members of the staff and right. things like that. We do not. We treat each piece on its own objectively we really don't care who the author is for the most part i mean we did get a submission from sherman alexi uh, a few years ago and i sent the poetry editor a quick note saying it might be in our best interest we publish something from <laughs> uh but other than that um you know we try to let the piece stand on its own you know, and we don't really care too much about who the writer is. And I realized we're taking a risk here, but we want to publish the best that that comes in. 
You know, we love literature, we love reading stories, we love reading poetry, and we just want to share the best of what we have uh, come across with others um, as unrestricted a means as possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, and another observation, you have published a lot of well-known poets. <laughs> we have, yes. Yeah. Do you, is that um, more true in the poetry, would you say, than the prose? I think so. Um, I don't know why, <laughs> but um, I think so. I'm not quite sure why. <laughs> do you, what kind of um, marketing does the magazine do? I guess I'm like thinking again about um, it's sort of simple, kind of humble <laughs> vibe. Um, and I don't see Somerset Review um, like getting into big Twitter, you know, spats or whatever no no we've, um, we're very okay. we're very humble as you say and on our um page that lists our previous issues at the very top it says welcome to our humble little corner of the universe <laughs> uh, all the issues are free by the way there's no charge there's no submission fee or anything um so um we don't really put ourselves out there we have a twitter account we'll tweet when we release a new issue if something big happens we'll tweet that um, but we really don't go out of our way. It's a little unfortunate. I mean, I consider myself a writer and an editor, not a, not a salesperson, and Aaron does too. So it's a little, it's a little difficult for us to take on those elements. Yeah, yeah. Um, sort of refreshing in some ways. I imagine it it puts the magazine at a deficit perhaps in terms of reach but it's also kind of refreshing to yes. <laughs> encounter yeah. a journal that's sort of like in its own little <laughs> space right definitely a deficit definitely um, yeah we'll see what we can do we did put out a few print issues um oh. back about 10 years ago we're mostly online but we did put out a few print issues i have one here it's, mm -hmm. it's a beautiful issue yeah. um and um Oddly enough, we did just the opposite of what everybody else does. Uh, we reprinted um, what we thought was the best of the best. So everything in the print issue is actually online for free. Mm -hmm. So that's probably why it didn't sell. <laughs> <laughs> but it's expensive to put out print issues. Or so the, yeah, yeah. So um, since you've been, you have sort of a long view of the submissions process, can you tell us about like how submissions have changed, like maybe trends that you see in submitting? Like, you know, did you see more pandemic related stories over the past few years? Are you seeing more death story, you know, or like what, what sort of trends, uh, I don't know, nostalgia or animals or... <laughs> Really, I don't see anything as having changed too much. I, if anything, uh, what we have been getting on occasion is a bunch of submissions from the same place. We uh, A few months ago, we got about 20 submissions from Brigham Young University over, mm. the, course of, over the course of a week. That's more than a coincidence. So some professor probably at yeah. that university said, I want you to write a story and I want you to send it to the Somerset Review. <laughs> so I'm complimented by it all. Uh, uh, that's really the only thing I think we've seen recently that I hadn't seen in the past. As far as content goes, I don't think much has changed mm -hmm. over the last 22 years. Yeah. How um, has editing the magazine affected your own writing? So you write fiction. I right? do. Short stories. I do. Work, yeah. How has it affected it? It really hasn't. Mm -hmm. um, I still make time for writing as well. So I, I have a good number of short stories published. I have a, at least 30, maybe 40. Uh, I've finished two novels and I'm writing a third right now. I set a goal, I set a goal of 1000 words a week. Yeah. So if you do the math, um, that takes about a year and you'll have a novel. So that's the way I wrote the first two and I'm working on the third. Oddly enough, I'm not getting that much attention from agents and people. Uh, I've got, I've got enough short stories now um, for three collections. 
and I am halfway through a third novel. So, and a, many of the short stories are published. So I was, I thought agents would be happy to talk to me at this point, but evidently not. Um, so, but it doesn't really affect um, putting out the Somerset Review. I, I look at them as two different things, and they don't really get in the way of each other. Yeah, yeah. And do other, I think something people always think is that editors have an advantage in submitting and placing their work because they can say they're an editor and that editors are sort of like publishing other editors. Has that been your experience at all? Not really. I do put in my bio that I'm the editor of the Somerset Review. Um, you know, the rejection rate that, that I'm experiencing is still about 99%. So I don't know <laughs> if that really normal. makes wow. I don't know if that really makes a difference. Right. Uh, in, you know. Um, yeah. Hmm. yeah. So it sounds like um, Somerset would be a great home for new writers. Are a lot of the writers that you publish, uh, like this is their first publication? We usually average, um, for prose, we usually average about one new writer, debut writer per issue. And we only publish about five prose pieces an issue. So right. one out of five. Now this is, an, this is an average. I'm not stepping into this saying we are giving more weight to debut writers. Mm -hmm. In fact, we've had a debut writer um, reprinted in Pen America collection a few years oh. ago. They flew him all the way up to um, oh. Housing Works in Manhattan and he read, read his story, it was great. Got paid money too. Um, but I don't particularly seek out debut writers, but mm -hmm. I do give a bit of preferential treatment to them in a certain aspect, I'll describe the aspect. So um, if I'm choosing between two stories that I believe have equal merit, right? Mm. Honestly, equal merit, as best as I can judge. And one of them is by a writer who has many credits to his or her name. And one of them is a debut writer. I would go with the debut writer. And mm. it's probably a selfish move because by chance, if this debut writer strikes it famous, Mm -hmm. I can now make the claim mm -hmm. I was the first to publish this right. <laughs> so, but I don't really let that influence me greatly. Mm -hmm. I want I want to publish the best of what I read. Yeah. It sounds like the cover letter, because I know writers also worry about their cover letters a lot. It sounds like that's probably not something that's important to you. To this not really. It's yeah. not really. As I said, I mean, I flagged down my poetry editor when Sherman Alexi sent something. So that, <laughs> that that mattered. Um, but other than that, no, we do get quite a few submissions with absolutely no text hmm. uh, in the cover letter. It's just an attachment, a Word document attachment. And so no, like, dear editors, not even no, agreeing. Nothing. nothing. Uh, all it is is an attachment. I open it up and I see the story. Oh, wow. Uh, and I don't really mind that. Um, I guess I would prefer a cover letter. I, I do find that those who do write a cover letter and say something about what something we've published, like I like this poem in your last issue, I do find that when I get a submission like that, the submission is generally more compatible with what we're looking for than when someone doesn't send, say anything. Mm -hmm. But we try not to let any of that influence our decisions. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you would like to see more of in submissions in particular? I think more cover letters that say we like this piece. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we we that work hard. <laughs> we put a lot out there and we rarely get the credit for it, right? Um, whenever I Google the Somerset Review, it's a, it's a little bit saddening for the person who found uh -huh. it and edited it. Whenever I Google the Somerset Review, there's plenty of search results. 95% mm. of them are about a author's whose work appeared in the Somerset Review, right? It's it's not something, wow, I read this story in the Somerset Review. Here's the link. It's about an author who's already been published here. Mm -hmm. I know they're marketing themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a little discouraging. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, aside from the cover letter, <laughs> in the are there any like subjects you want to see more of or 
um, styles, more humor, more, I don't know, anything? I would always be up for humor. Um, I don't see too much of it. Mm. It's tough to do humor well, yes, I think. Yes, true. Um, but I would be very open to a funny piece, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, style, yes. Um, what else? I don't think I have anything to add to what I said previously on that. Um, is anything... Definitely, definitely humor. Playing with the language, something like that would be. Um, maybe um, another thing that I like to see is the inclusion of some facts hmm. about something, even if it's fiction, mm -hmm. right? Somebody once said, I forget who said it, there's nothing more true than fiction, which sounds like an oxymoron, right? But I love reading fine details about true places, true events, um, even in fiction, I think it's important that that be included in the story. That's interesting. Um, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and what about the, what's the ideal length for a prose piece? Um, anything under 8,000 words. Wow. Anything under 8,000, which is pretty high, uh, right? Um, and also, um, many writers don't realize this, but the guidelines say 8,000 words. So that could mean a story up to 8,000, or it could mean six flash pieces, mm -hmm. where if you add up the total, it's still under 8,000. I'm, I'm receptive to that too, so. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything you wish more submitters knew about the magazine? Or maybe even, I'm curious if you get submissions that are like way off the mark, like they think because it's a summer set you only publish you know stories about the summer <laughs> or oh. something like that like anything you would want to tell submitters like you know this is what we do um well one quick thing that comes to mind is we're generally pretty quick at publishing things right so from the time we get the submission to the time it gets published on average is probably three to four months Right. And we like to keep in line with the seasons. Right. So if you send us a piece in, let's say, late summer. Right. About and it's set in summertime. Right. That piece would have been published in the winter. That doesn't make sense. Right. We don't yeah. want to publish pieces based in the summer season in the winter. Mm -hmm. So and we're not going to hold pieces over. That gets a little messy. Mm -hmm. So we would just reject a piece like that. Um, but really? that's in that's in the advice. I, I strongly recommend anybody who wants to submit to um, look at the advice page off the submission guidelines. It's 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 all right there. So just to clarify, so if somebody's submitting, uh, let's say they're submitting in the fall, and it's a story that is set during the summer, that's something that you would not even consider. Probably not. Probably mm -hmm. not. Unless they really wow me in those first three paragraphs, we probably wouldn't because we would be publishing it in the winter. Right. And we generally don't want to put something out in the winter that's, you know, on a beach in Long Island. So. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Um, would you consider hybrid creative nonfiction uh, work that includes photographs to support the piece? Yes. <laughs> um, and even more so with nonfiction. In fact, sometimes when we accept a nonfiction piece, I will ask the writer, hey, I see this piece is about Jordan. Do you have uh, your visit to Jordan? Do you have any photos that you would like us to consider? Send as many as you want. I can't guarantee I will put any with the piece, but I'll certainly give it some thought. And we did publish a good number of nonfiction pieces where we have some uh photos that go with the piece and it, it's it's a nice experience and do you work with writers to revise pieces okay so yes i don't think i've ever accepted a piece without any revision so hmm. there's always something that i would ask the writer to consider mm -hmm. okay and sometimes it's um if i can just tell a quick little story here sometimes it's difficult um, to decide whether I want to publish a piece that has very little modification needed 
over a piece that has considerable modification needed, but I think that once we're done, it's going to be a great piece, right? Mm. It's a tough decision, okay? I can get a piece coming in from a good writer, piece is well-written, it's a good piece, right? Or I can get a piece from someone who maybe is a debut writer or someone who doesn't have many credits, and the piece needs work, right? You can see it's not great written piece, but it has a lot of potential. It depends on my mood. Yeah. Sometimes I'm willing to do it and work with the writer. And sometimes I just don't think the writer deserves to be published. Mm. If they have so many small issues with the, um, the piece. The other risk I take is that we could work on it fix it up, make it great and publish it. And now the writer goes ahead and publishes other work that's pretty shoddy, mm. right? And now I kind of look bad because, oh. because I published something from that writer and now other people are writing in Amazon reviews saying, who, pub well, who was the publisher of this? Because it stinks. So I run the risk there, but so. Do you think that would happen? I, I feel like people would see that there was a, one amazing story and probably think, oh, he must have had a great editor for that story. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that it would reflect poorly on, I, th I feel like it would reflect well on you. Uh, <laughs> well, all I could tell you is that I did work with an author extensively on a story about 10 years ago. It's a fictional, fictional piece. Loved the outcome. She worked with me very well on it. Most writers do that. I really yeah. have to say that the writers that, that, that submit to the Somerset Review are really nice and they really take my comments to part mm. so anyway um this writer went ahead we made this the changes changed the story pretty significantly uh i loved it published it and i remember reading the next year she had something published a full book on amazon and the reviews were really bad mm. and, <laughs> um and i remember working with this author a lot on the yeah. piece i published I didn't have a good feeling, you know, um, um, so I don't know. It doesn't happen often. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it did happen. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Um, so what is it that you're seeing, like when you will take on a piece for revision that's not quite there, what is it that you're, like what is the kernel that you're seeing in those works? Is it a authentic voice? Is it a original character, original setting, like a... A conceit that you think is really interesting it it spans the globe it's just about everything everything from punctuation and grammar misspellings with proper nouns okay fruit loops is f-r-o-o-t not <laughs> f-r-u-i-t okay uh so misspelling of proper nouns repeated <laughs> words is a big one uh sometimes continuity is not quite right they'll change a the scene but I won't know what, where they are or what had transpired to get them there. So some continuity issues sometimes uh, take place. Uh, past tense, present tense mix mm -hmm. up. That mm -hmm. happens a lot. You know, with fiction, there are no rules. You can do whatever you want. But generally, you want to try to keep to the same tense unless you're really playing with style. Yeah. So I see a lot of that also. So it, it really runs the gamut. There's yeah. just about everything. <laughs> but the pieces that you're willing to work on, that you sort of accept provisionally, is there something, like what gems are you seeing in there that makes you accept the piece, even though it's not quite ready? Um, I don't really know how to answer that other than to say I just loved it. Yeah. <laughs> There's something about it that I just loved. Mm -hmm. um, it usually touches on, you know, the human element, um, and I've fallen in love with the character. Mm -hmm. Like I said, character-driven stories are the ones we really like. There's something about the character that I just really liked. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned readers earlier. Is that something, if somebody's listening to this and they're like, oh, this, is, this sounds great, I'd love to get more involved with this magazine should they just send you an email directly and try to you know apply as a reader or do you not need readers right now um i could use readers i believe i ran it by erin on poetry once and she said she's fine the way she is so probably um only prose mm -hmm. but if you send me an email um 
and um, are willing to um, help out a little bit, I would be receptive to that. Like I said, it's all volunteer work. I, you know, send Aaron a little holiday gift once a year. But <laughs> other than other than that, we do this because of just the love of literature. You know, it's something we can't not do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, and uh, going back to the cover letter, uh, do you require or want a short bio and what should be included in the bio? Um, yeah, like I said, we've uh, we've even read pieces with absolutely no cover letter. <laughs> so don't feel as though, um, you know, your cover letter is going to be really, really important. OK, it's not like a student trying to get a job and making sure their resume is great. Uh, it's just I want to read the piece. Um, one thing I don't like to see, and I think many editors will say this, is we don't like to see uh, any description of the story in the cover letter. Mm. You don't let the piece stand on its own. I don't need any any background information. I do see lately that some people are giving disclaimers, like please note there is a violent scene or there is this or that. I don't want any of that either. I don't care. I just want to start with the first sentence, blow me away with that first sentence, and I will keep reading. <laughs> Yes, that's a very, the content warnings is a very sort of... Uh, content warnings, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, and a question. So you mentioned that uh, people can submit multiple flash pieces under 8,000 words. Um, is that also true? Well, the question is, can two very different pieces that are combined under 8,000 words be submitted at the same time? That's fine, too. The, okay. the only guideline we have, the only rule is it has to be under 8,000 words. That's it. So if somebody wanted to submit like two, 3,000 word stories, they could do that. And they you should put it in one document or two as two separate stories? Okay. We're kind of flexible. Uh, I know that Aaron for poetry likes everything in one document. So we accept up to five poems in submission. So we like that all to be in one document. As far as short stories go, it doesn't really matter. I, Whenever I get submissions of prose containing more than one story, usually the writer has them in separate documents. So I'm I'm fine with that. Okay. okay. Um, and also for hybrid uh, poetry and prose hybrid, do you accept that? And how do you... Um, we do. Um, sometimes it's kind of difficult, as you probably know, to classify a piece, right? Yeah. Even sometimes in a literary magazine, you won't know what it is. Some literary magazines don't even have categories for mm -hmm. fiction, poetry. They just put everything out there, which I'm not quite sure I like. I guess I suppose that's okay, um, but we would take it. We, we, you know, I, I if it doesn't say in the title that it's strictly um, poetry or fiction, I will open it up and make a determination of what I think it is, and it. it resembles more like poetry than prose i'll send it off to aaron and we may um review it as poetry but i mean if the author comes back to us and says no this is a hybrid piece it's in it's gray area it's in between we would work with that i think okay um, and so I have one final question, and you may know if you've seen my other videos, it's a question I ask all editors, um, and you've been doing this for a while. <laughs> so I'm curious what keeps you going, what keeps you motivated? You mentioned you've never taken a break, which is quite extraordinary. So um, have you ever felt like taking a break? Have you ever felt burned out? And what's kept you at this work? Okay, so as far as burning out, it's just the opposite. I mean, this is something I just love to do, okay? I'm never going to stop. I suppose my goal is to beat C. Michael Curtis. C. Michael Curtis is the fiction editor of The Atlantic for six decades. <laughs> that's amazing. And I guess my goal would be to beat him. I, I don't think that's a realistic goal, but I'm going to try. Uh and we'll see how that goes. So I have no intention of stopping. And um, we'll see. Uh, we had a 20th anniversary issue two years ago. 
And we thought, well, what do we want to do? Do we want to do a launch party? Do we want to put bells and whistles on the site and all that other stuff? We actually took the opposite approach. We decided to publish in that issue twice as much work hmm. as we normally publish. So we celebrated on our own that way. That's great. I wonder too if your your sustenance comes like it's just you're doing what you're doing. <laughs> you're not trying to do 80 million things and be on top of, you know, whatever current like fad is happening out in the lit mag. You know, you're just consistently putting out a very simple, clear, straightforward magazine. And it, it sort of manages. I, the I think if it wasn't simple, if it was complicated, I wouldn't be here. All right. Yeah. The reason that I kept it so simple is the reason it's still around. Yeah, I think. It totally makes sense. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you so much, Joseph. It's a wonderful magazine. And thank you all for coming out today. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.